Jan, thank you in the trio. What that was a most thoughtful. Please join us. Come on out and have a seat. Okay. <clears throat> so, Susan, will you please tell us a little about your, a bit about yourself, your service, and what you're up to there? Okay. Well, I'm president and CEO of the DPAA, which is the Digital Place-Based Ad Association. And um, if we could go to the first slide, or better yet, I can click. Um, our mission statement is to drive consistent growth for this, this medium, and in a second I'll describe to you what it is. Um, but we do that through a very collaborative approach with um, a whole group of people. Um, our members include network operators, as well as sales organizations that are involved in this space, research companies, software suppliers, and we have a very substantial international effort going on right now. Um, and then we work with our agency advisory board, as well as a brand advisory group that um, are all engaged in helping us figure this space out. Um, I promise to describe to you what digital play-based media is. Um, quickly, it is screens that you find out in the marketplace, away from home, all along the path to purchase, um, restaurants and bars, in um, office lobbies and elevators, in doctor's offices, uh, airports, on airplanes, all sorts of different places. They all have one thing in common, and that is that they have dwell time. And the reason I point that out will become clear when we get into the research, but it's important to understand that these screens have dwell time and they are programmed with content in which ads are placed. Um, they're digital, video, addressable, internet enabled, and many of them are interactive. So what it is not, and this is a source of confusion in this sector, um, it is not static images digitally delivered to a spot. Now, digital out of home is traditionally thought of as static images digitally delivered, but there is no content and there is no dwell time. Right. And so for us, dwell time and content are key differentiators. So think of yourself waiting for, an, um, for a flight, you're sitting at the gate, you're watching CNN. CNN airport is digital place based. That's it. Got it. Awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Doug Pulick, would you like to join us, please? Thanks. Thank you for that smattering of applause out there. I, I, do, I do appreciate <laughs> that. Um, Okay, uh, head of National Cinemedia. Uh, we're a company that's been around for, uh, in one iteration or another, uh, 10 years. Uh, and we've got uh, about 1,500 theaters, about 19,000 screens. We average somewhere in, uh, from around 650 million to about 700 million uh, attendees, uh, moviegoers each year. Uh, so we've got about 62% of the share of that national uh, audience out there. And just as you can see from the quick litany of uh, some of the measurement systems. I'm sure we'll get into it uh, as, we, as we go on. Uh, but the various types of uh, systems that we actually uh, have out there in terms of using Nielsen, uh, using Telmar, MRI, various others. Um, so that's, I guess, pretty much what I can tell you at this moment. Terrific. One slide. Uh, that's Love it. it. And sure. last, Jack Koch, would you like to join us? <laughs> there you go. So, um, there we go. Okay. Excellent. so um, Director of Global Marketing uh, Insights at EA, and uh, if you aren't familiar with EA, we're one of the world's largest video game publishers. Uh, we, do serve, uh, we do have games, uh, premium content across all major platforms and devices. Uh, you may have heard of Madden, SimSocial, those sort of games. And uh, across all of our platforms and devices, we have 302 million unique monthly players worldwide, uh, which is pretty large. Um, the group I particularly work in is Global Media Solutions Group, uh, which really focuses on connecting brands with that premier content in relevant and impactful ways. Uh, and we do also focus on uh, large, seamless, cross-platform marketing opportunities, which is pretty unique, not only in the gaming space, but just advertising networks in general. Uh, some examples of, of our recent uh, integrations. Uh, you can see Toyota Prius and The Sim Social, one of our most popular social games. And this is an example of value exchange. So uh, a gamer puts Toyota Prius in the game. 
Uh, they interact with it, they get mood boost, something that pushes them forward within the game. So you can see here the advertisements are also beneficial to the brand, but gamers as well. We are very pro-gamer at EA. And uh, another example, Gatorade and Madden 12, um, one of our most popular console titles. And this is an example um, where if Gatorade wasn't in the game, it would look strange. So um, definitely increasing realism and enjoyment. And then an example of cross-platform integrations we do is, uh, for example, Dove and Pop It, one of our most popular casual games. Uh, we integrated Dove across all different platforms and devices in the game Pop It. So uh, another excellent integration there. And then just lastly, wanted to go through, um, we, uh, my team particularly works on everything from audience metrics to platform metrics, advertising effectiveness, thought leadership. So we work with a variety of uh, analytics partners, many of whom are in this room, more sponsoring this event. So uh, excited to be working with them and excited to be here as well. Great. And you did a good job putting the logos up there instead of just writing it on the slide. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. That was our warm up round. Uh, so we're going to move into the counting metrics round. So we focus on keeping these buckets of metrics separate mm -hmm. on the front end of planning. So we think about things of counting metrics, those fundamental measures of delivery. And I really appreciated the conversation from the last panel. So we, we focus on reach and frequency, composition and coverage, impressions, rating points, those sorts of measures um, as our standard. Uh, why don't you tell me, Susan, a little bit about some of the, the, those measures that okay. you guys are using um, and your clients specifically? Yeah. Well. Um, Digital play-based media, uh, first we had to define it, right? But um, beyond that, with, with dwell time and content as being important, um, back in 2008, er, early days of digital play-based media, um, we decided that the first initiative that we were going to take on was to define a common currency. And um, because you, if you're not measured, you don't exist. Uh, so um, this slide that we just put up um, describes our audience metric guidelines at a 30,000 foot level. And it made sense that because we're away from home media that we start with measuring traffic. Um, but we, of course, couldn't start, stop there. So the next place we went was to define the network dwell zone or the time, you know, the, whether somebody was close enough to a screen to actually take in that content. Mm -hmm. But the third step we took in this process, and this is where dwell time matters, and that is that we decided that it wasn't important just to measure whether someone was in the network zone, but whether they noticed and for how long they were in that network zone, so the dwell time, relative to the loop length or the commercial, expo the, 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 the programming loop. So a good example. Um, and I'm making these numbers up. If you take an elevator ride and that elevator has Captivate screen on it, in it, um, and your elevator ride is 30 seconds, but the loop length is two minutes, then you will, we will only ascribe 25% of the impressions um, against that. So we took a very large number and made it smaller and smaller to a point where time was taken into account apropos for a television medium. That's great, Doug. With us, uh, I mean, we started very early on back in uh, 2002. We actually uh, helped fund a pilot study with, uh, with Nielsen, where one of the things that we had, uh, we actually knew what our attendance was, uh, because obviously we had tickets, ticket sales. Uh, but what we didn't have was the demographic element to it. So what we uh, had done with Nielsen was pretty much help them, they really developed the algorithm to take a look at average ticket prices, divide it into total box office, gives you attendance. Um, and when we took a look at that in relation to our own uh, actual attendance, the deviation was never more than five percentage points. So I felt very, very confident with that. And so what Nielsen did was they ultimately then took uh, a second step in terms of actually taking a look at uh, telephone uh, intercepts in insofar as what people had, uh, what films that they had seen in the last seven days. So they collected that, married the, uh, the two data pieces together. So that was really the start of it, but from that we burgeoned on to just all the data points that you could potentially look at uh, uh, now. My background is television, obviously, as anybody uh, who knows me out there. Um, and so we don't have average audience, but we have total audience, but we also have frequency, so obviously you can get to reach. Mm -hmm. And so you can start to do reach and frequency analysis, and you can start to do, uh, as we've started to get in incorporated into some of the market mix modeling systems and whatnot. So I find it kind of interesting hearing about the GRP just when I thought we were getting it right, suddenly doesn't mean, it's not important anymore. 
Um, so in any event, uh, so we've got that. And again, as I you saw on the slide before, MRI data, looking at profiling, fusion data that we have that takes you, takes you beyond just a little bit of that age, sex uh, type of break. Terrific, and Jack. Yeah. Yeah, so games advertising really was developed uh, from an interesting standpoint. Uh, you know, where the budget comes from for games advertising from marketers or advertisers is different everywhere. You know, are we online? Are we emerging? You know, where, where does that budget come from? So we've had to, uh, in a frustrating manner, you know, develop metrics that meet and exceed all those different expectations. So I think we're at a point now where we can measure comparably to all different types of media comparably as um, other digitally served media. So it's everything from the impressions, the frequency, the reach. Uh, we've dabbled with GRP as well. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it really has become, gaming has become a comparable medium to, to other forms of digitally served media. Where it gets really interesting is cross-platform advertising and trying to figure out how to report on that with metrics. And uh, w you know, rather than just delivering an online report or a social report or a mobile report, wh which is what we've done in the past, about a year ago, we said, well, we can serve ads seamlessly across platform. How do we measure across platform and report across platform? So we spent about a year um, developing a product called EA Legend, which is an online data visualization dashboard. That's a lot of buzzwords, but what it basically means is all of the metrics from a client's advertising campaign are brought into one singular tool uh, and measured on the same metrics. So you can see a great view of your entire campaign and optimize across different platforms. And I think that's something uh, really unique to, to at least EA. But it is with all the metrics that are typically from digitally served advertising and comparable. That's great. And do you think, are these measures evolving since you've developed them? And are they getting traction as sort of currency measures or um, good data input for planning tools or models and things like that? Yeah. Um, to me? Yeah. You can go first. Whichever. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they, there's been great market acceptance of, for us, the audience metric guidelines. Um, and we now have four solid years of measurement um, by third party research companies and lots of um, studies done so that those guidelines are moving towards standards over time. Mm -hmm. If you think of digital place based media, there are so many different kinds of venues that it really ups the complexity of um, measurement. So as we approach, uh, we look forward to the point in time that we can get to standards, um, probably with some form of technology that'll be able enable us to get there. But for the, in the meantime, the market seems satisfied with what we've got, and and we've supplemented it by um, including we're we're now on IMS, and we we finally have a logo on uh, the Clear Decisions <laughs> desktop which is exciting, um, and we're in all the syndicated <laughs> sources. So there's a lot, um, yeah, I get excited about that kind of stuff. Um, but there's, so there's a lot of measurement and a lot of, um, a lot of different sources out there that can help lead us to great insights and help in the planning process. That's great. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, I mean, for us, but, uh, when, again, when I, when I was hired, it was the whole idea of, all right, let's, let's try to figure out you know, what is the most widely used types of metrics, and obviously, having a TV background, we said, well, let's, let's go after television with sight, sound, and motion, so that, so that makes the most sense. Um, the irony was is that, in the beginning, we tended to be placed in a lot of out-of-home agencies in, in terms of that category. Um, one of my favorite stories was uh, I went to see David Ernst over at an initiative at that time, and I said, David, I said, can you tell me, where, where, where do you classify cinema? It was one, like one of my first days on the job. He said, I don't know, Doug, let me see. Mm -hmm. Something's computer. You're in other. I said, excellent. Ah, it's a great way to start a new career. So, uh, so obviously, what I did was I just you know pulled back on, in terms of looking at, at the background that I have in terms of uh, the types of metrics that I like to, that, that were used in television. And so we started to use that. And I like to think that's been great because systems now like TARDIS. Uh, and various other uh, channel planning systems and whatnot are actually starting to incorporate cinema. Even some of the market mix modeling systems are actually starting to, uh, to actually incorporate that. So, but, but what was interesting was that it was a, very much of an educational process early on, because as I said, we tended to be in the out-of-home category, and so folks were like, nah, I don't quite always get this reach and frequency stuff, and well, you know, you know, where, where you were going with all this. So, um, so from that perspective, I mean, we're starting to get certainly more, more of an acceptance. Um, yeah, like I said before, I mean, we are measured in comparable ways to other forms of advertising. So as they uh, move forward and as they progress, you know, we catch on as well. I think what's interesting is what we're starting to see is, is so much data. 
especially from digitally served, served medium, and being able to, to advertise as marketers to check the box, yes, we have CTR, yes, we have impressions, yes, we have reach. So being able to use our tools and our expertise to help them figure out what, um, what metrics make sense for their campaign and be able to focus and look um, at the right metrics rather than just all the metrics and, and using some of our products like EA Legend to do that um, as well and working with our third parties. One of the, I mean, if you don't mind uh, 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 my saying, is that one of the ironies I found was that, again, having come from cable, was is that we, we said, all right, let's figure out all the things we learned wrong that we did in cable and let's not do it uh, uh, in terms of cinema. And one of the things was coverage area ratings and the whole okay, idea yeah. of looking universes that are specific only to a, a cable network so that a planner could look at it and say, ah, so a 0.4 rating here is not a 0.4. It, it doesn't make any sense. Shrinking the so, denominator. Well, that's right, for sure, <laughs> exactly. for sure. And so we said, so we're just going to go strictly national. It's a, you know, a, a GRP is a US TV GRP. And one of the great ironies is like one of the first times I walked into an agency and they said, but shouldn't you have a different universe? It's smaller than the, it's like, oh, all this stuff I've been trying to work on and try to make it easier for you. Um, so, so it's just, <laughs> it's, always, it's always been a challenge. It's like just when you think you turn the corner and doing something. It's, Blows up in your face. Go with total pop, man. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so that's actually a great segue for the second half is effectiveness. And um, we're really focused on quantifying that in a variety of different ways. Obviously, understanding the relative value of an exposure on Hulu versus other choices in a world where there's a lot of media choices. CPMs are all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's really important to demonstrate <laughs> performance, whether it's impact on the funnel or you're selling something, you're acquiring customers. Um, you're driving search lift, a lot of different ways to sort of quantify performance and effectiveness for ROI. Um, how are you guys thinking about this? It's, it's, uh, it, it takes a lot of time and it's a, a really big investment. And are you finding that it, it's really worth it? Completely worth it. Um, it leads to new business and repeat business. It solidifies this on the plans um, because when, it, when the results are there. And um, absolutely, it's, it's worth all the time and effort we put into it. Right. How about you? Well, if you believe the survey results that you saw, there's no other alternative because right. the GRP <laughs> is obviously going away. Uh, for, I mean, for us, it's, it's absolutely essential because of the fact that because we have limited inventory, we have a much higher CPM than a lot of other types of media out there. So the first thing is everybody sort of gets the size, gets the quote unquote impact, and it's like, how much are you? Ooh, maybe not. Um, and I mean, I was even having some discussions with some folks today where, you know, we look at a lot of the things that, uh, you know, using uh, brand effect, uh, AKA uh, IAG, in terms of looking at the brand recall and message recall and tying that all together and even, uh, you know, working with folks like, like uh, Interscope to try to take a look at that whole engagement. You know, it's certainly all there. And it's, for us, it's always overcoming not, the, the, I guess, the value of the media as much as it's, it's the real price point, it's the cost. Mm -hmm. And the only way for me to do that is to do it through effectiveness. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. For, for gaming, it, it's, it's extremely important because it justifies us from a third party perspective what we're doing comparable to other sorts of medium as well. So uh, it's definitely important. Um, and we, you know, just like everybody else on this panel, we do the same things, awareness, frequency, recall. We have the ability to do all of that. Um, where we see it sort of shifting, and I wonder if you guys are seeing the same thing, is more towards sales, impact of sales. So we're seeing a lot of, um, not only requests, but we're working with, with a lot of clients for uh, offline sales um, effectiveness on, on how the advertising affected offline sales or drive to site and search. You know, we're getting very apt at doing that sort of um, research at this point. So, um, so that's where we see it sort of moving, but we're never going to leave the, the effectiveness studies, you know, the, the panel, the, the surveys, things like that. Uh, otherwise, I think we're all going to see reduced budgets and headcount, and everybody's going to get very nervous in this room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I mean, for us, I know, I'm, I'm, I mean, we've done something where, for instance, we had uh, uh, done um, uh, an analysis for HP. HP did something where they actually obviously had an on-screen presence, but what they also did was it was kind of interesting, and quite frankly, um, I was a bit surprised that was they wanted to do a promotion that we call a lobby domination, where what they do is they pretty much covered about, I'd say, maybe 20 lobbies throughout the U.S., and in those lobbies, they had uh, hands-on opportunities to take a look at printers, to experiment with them, to have a photo taken of yourself or your girlfriend, whatever, and then you know have it, have it printed. 
And clearly, you can see that the value there is, A, you're in the theater, and they, uh, they were actually driving you literally to go out into the lobby after the film and then actually experiment with this. And what we did was pretty much an analysis of in terms of looking at where you might be, in a, a, in a purchasing funnel for something like this, but also, two, taking a look at uh, intent to purchase. And the intent to purchase was certainly dramatically higher, obviously, in those theaters where you had the opportunity uh, to actually touch, uh, touch the actual HP printer as opposed to those that did not when we compared it. So from the perspective of actual sales, I mean, we've gotten some indications from some of the CPG companies who have been uh, nice enough to provide us with that information. The problem is, is that they don't always give us a frame of reference so that we'll see that we're, getting, we're driving a dollar twenty worth of yeah, worth of uh, uh, you know worth of uh, value, but I don't know if that's higher or lower than somebody yeah. else. So. Yeah. Sure. Context can be important. Right. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so, I have one last question. Two two questions really. One is, is there any myth out there with regards to your your medium that you're representing today that you'd like to put to bed today for everyone here? Um, and then lastly. If there was one thing with regards to research, like big wishful thinking, what would you do to change or evolve the, the landscape? Oh, I love this. Um, the myth. People watch these screens, and they actually enjoy the experience of these of encountering screens out in the marketplace and, and watching ads on them relative to other media types. Um, so, and, you know, this is from a person who, whenever I get in a cab, I actually turn the volume up and, <laughs> and I watch, I, I, I enjoy uh, media. So, um, and some people don't, so they might um, expand that, you know, take that experience. But what we do have is we have a lot of research that has um, given us insights as to the way most people uh, consume this media. And um, there was, for two years, Mendelssohn um, affluent study has been reporting on this space. And they've asked questions about how people feel about um, ads as they encounter them out in the marketplace, mm -hmm. in addition to other media types. And what they have come back um, with is what I'll call the millennial effect, which is the younger and the more affluent the audience, the more they like to encounter these screens out in the marketplace, but they also like to see ads out in the marketplace as well, and better than many other media types. So people like to encounter these ads, and they enjoy seeing programming on screens outside of the home. So one research big wish? 24-7 measurement on a syndicated uh, panel, um, single source, and, and I want ROI from every client. <laughs> you know, at a low cost. At a low cost, <laughs> at, a, at a low cost, but yes. Jack, how about you? Uh, first with the myth. Sure. I guess. Uh, so uh, I would love to dispel a myth about a myth. So uh, dispel, dispel the myth about the myth that uh, advertisers and marketers still think that males 18 to 34s are the only ones gaming. Um, you know, we've gotten way past that. Uh, advertisers and marketers are, are smart. They're getting smarter about gaming. They have gaming departments, uh, gaming um, segments within, within their company. And they know that everybody's gaming. They know that um, they can reach a, a large variety of people uh, through, through games advertising, and that we can measure it in the same way. So I think we can kind of put that to bed, because frankly, if we couldn't measure it the same way, I think we wouldn't be as successful as we are with, with shifting mm -hmm. dollars. Um, a, a wish, I think, that would be pretty fun is for, uh, I think every researcher maybe should take a marketing class. Um, and I was talking to some of my research friends earlier about this, and they said, well, every marketing person should take a research class. But sticking on the first point, um, I think we get bogged down in facts and figures a lot. Um, and I think it's important for us to remember that we have to make the facts and figures digestible. Um, we have to realize actionable insights from that data. And I think as advertising researchers, it's important for us to be able to do that. And it makes a good researcher a great researcher. And I think if we all were to do that, I think it would be very impactful for our industry, for our respective clients. Great. And Doug? Uh, the mid that the butter on our popcorn isn't real. It's absolutely real. It's good for you, too, in fact. It's top um, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, no, I'm just being silly. Uh, the, uh, the myth, probably, I, I would say, is um, that you can't buy us demographically. Um, that uh, folks tend to think you, you sort of buy a, a total movie going audience. That, that's just simply not true. We get the demographic data now, actually, well, on, uh, on a monthly basis. 
But what Nielsen has also been starting to provide us with is um, genre information, mm. where we can actually start to profile uh, films and obviously clusters of types of films that you could buy for a given, uh, given month or a uh, given period. So we can certainly do that. Um, so it's, that's just about so becoming So you're getting more. audience comps by genre. That's we absolutely great. do. We absolutely do. So you can sit and say, you know, if I'm trying to reach uh, women 18 to 49 or 25 to 54 and men, whatever it might be, we can actually say, let's take a look. I mean, the, the, one of the greatest frustrations for me, in one sense, is never work at a place where you don't control the actual content. Uh, but what we can do is we can get the profile of what the content is that's coming down the pike. And so we can try to sort of steer someone away there for make, looking for a third quarter buy. We might be able to say July would be a better month than August, for argument's sake, that for you to try to reach women or kids or... Uh, whatever it actually might be, and put, put those packages together. Um, and I see that we're out of time in terms of the wish. Um, I wish that this was over. I wish that <laughs> probably that um, we would be uh, included in much more of the planning systems that are out there, that in that sense, some of, these, those, some of those evaluation systems would be a little more, if you will, Catholic with a small c, and just include more, more uh, non-traditional media. Yeah. All right, I will, I'll see Susan's wish and I'll Amazing. raise her that everyone in the country is mandated to be part of a panel. <laughs> so there you go. In, in, all, in, in all of their media across all devices is counted in the same way. That'd be awesome. And that's it. Thank you guys very much. Yes, thank you. Well, Brian, I didn't know that Gulu was carrying Fantasy Island based on your last answer. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, a couple of things I, I just have to say. Uh, thank you, Brian, Susan, Jack, and Brian.